Okay, so hello everybody, welcome. Uh, the session that is about to begin deals with the characters and the behavior and the usage of different color spaces, namely, namely RGB, CMYK and LAB. You may be familiar with all three of them or maybe just one of them. Ah, I'm not familiar with my computer, as you see. Type my password again, and so, okay. Uh, but before we start, let me tell you who I am. My name is Marco Olivotto. I am a physicist, actually, and I mainly work in the field of image color correction. I do mean static images, not movies. And uh, I uh, have been a student with Dan Margulis, who is the man who actually invented or coded, to better say, um, color correction in Photoshop. Mm? I've been doing so for the last six years. I currently teach myself. I'm a writer for different magazines. I'm a consultant, and I still do produce images. Um, so, the subject of this lesson. We're going to discuss the different characters, characteristics and differences between the three main color spaces, RGB, CMYK, LAB. They are not the only one color spaces. We have one, say, XYZ, which is widely used in theoretics and uh, even behind uh, the curtain in the computer sometimes. But in general terms, I remember, uh, I remind you that we should be talking about color models in this case, because when I say RGB, I'm just uh, saying the name of something that follows certain rules that we will see, but there, are, there is not one single RGB, there are many, like sRGB, Adobe RGB, Profoto RGB, White Gamut RGB, there are lots of them, and moreover, there is one particular RGB for every display in the world, monitors, I mean, so your monitor has a certain RGB space which is described by a profile. So a color space is actually the real incarnation of an abstract color model, like, I like to make this comparison, it's like, say, human being. We all know how we are made. We have two legs, huh? we have two arms, we have an head made a certain way, but then we are all different, you know? There is a tall guy or a small guy or a fat guy, and so many differences, although we belong to the same model. So in Photoshop in particular, we have many RGBs, many CMYKs, but at least inside the program, and this is very interesting, we have only one LAB. So uh, while it's easy to mistake one RGB for another in color management, it's impossible inside Photoshop to get lab or LAB, how you call it, wrong, because it is unique. So let's start off with RGB. I think you all know it by name, at least. And the name is the acronym of red, green, and blue. So the three primary colors of what is called additive synthesis. Um, it is also the most mm, common model today because uh, all the digital cameras, all the scanners, and uh, uh, they actually acquire data on the principles, based on the principles of RGB. And so every monitor in the world works with RGB. Most of all, the web being uh, uh, something that is seen on a display, a monitor, or a tablet, or whatever you want, is RGB-based. There is no CMYK in, uh, in, uh, in the web. So it's a different world from printing. CMYK is instead the acronym of cyan, magenta, yellow, and key. Many people think that the K comes from the last letter of black, but that's not true, because black is the key plate on which every other plate is uh, uh, put to register, basically. So uh, CMYK, as you know, is a traditional printing space uh, that we use pigments or inks or any way, any kind of colorants, dyes. It, it's, uh, it's not important. They are mostly CMYK based. and. Uh, if we limit ourselves to the four process inks, as they are called, they are the basis for traditional offset printing. Hmm? Not only offset, but mainly. 
And of course, you can add additional inks, and you can have a hexachrome that was successful for a while. You have, of course, uh, spot colors like Pantone libraries and whatever you want, really. And then fine art printing, but as well as uh, also in digital printing and uh, garment printing, you can use a very broadly enhanced CMYK system, which means basically that even the cheapest, well not the cheapest, but a relatively cheap photographic printer will often have 8 or 10 or 11 different inks inside, all variations on CMYK plus some colors added for gamut reasons basically. Now let's come to LAB. Is any of you familiar, vaguely familiar with LAB? You've heard about it, but maybe you've never used it, all right? Um, it's the acronym of, well, L is the acronym of lightness, which basically means how light or dark is a color. Whereas the A and B mean nothing in particular. They are just letters. Could be LDF if we want, no <laughs> problem. And it is the most abstract color space of the three with completely different rules from both RGB and CMYK. And its main ability, which is very important in some cases, and I'll try to show you when and how, is that LAB, by its nature, separates luminosity and color completely. Um, this is uh, easy to emulate in RGB and CMYK, but it doesn't work that well as in lab. And LAB is considered a difficult color space, but it's also very powerful. Back to RGB, if you want to describe it a bit more in depth, uh, each channel, let's give the letters their actual name, a uh, red, green and blue channel, um, describes the intensity of light of uh, their own component, of course, of given color. So you actually build colors by adding different sources uh, of uh, red, uh, green and blue color in different per percentages. In 8-bit representation, you probably know each channel has a variation range between 0 and 255. If you wonder why such a strange number, not 100 or 1000, which would be easy, it depends on the fact that we are working with an 8-bit number which only has 256 possible values. That's 2 to the power of 8, basically. So if you count the 0 as well, that's the allowed range. Uh, the components should be thought as illuminants, and what I mean is that when I look at my monitor, I actually see colors because behind every pixel there are three sub-pixels. One is red, one is green, one is blue, and it's like tiny little lamps that go on together at different intensities. This is it. Zero means that a given light is completely off, so no light, and 255 uh, means that the lamp is maxed out and uh, we are at the top of the red or green on or, green on, uh, or blue range. So, zero in the three channels is black and 255 in the three channels is white. And there is a condition for a neutral color in well-behaved, because not all of them are well-behaved, RGB color spaces are equal to G equal to B means that we are looking at some kind of gray. So if I say 100, for instance, in each channel, it means gray of a given luminosity. Variations on the RGB theme. RGB is a color model, the one I just described, and when we actually say which color make up the red, green and blue component, we obtain a color space. We actually need a couple more things, but this is the more, most important thing the white point uh, and uh, also the gamma, so-called, so how tonal values are distributed. And uh, at the point, there was a huge uh, proliferation of different RGB color spaces, and it was quite a bloody battle, but in the end, only three survived in reality. I mean, every, uh, even vintage RGB color spaces out there, but the three that are really used today in different uh, sectors, basically, is sRGB, Adobe RGB, and Profoto RGB. And the main difference is gamut. Let me try to quickly give you an idea. This is a, a, an application inside Macintosh. It's called Color Sync Utility, and it's very useful to uh, check out which gamut, uh, which color extension a profile has. 
Now you're looking, you see it's a three-dimensional model that I can turn around. You're looking at sRGB, but as soon as I switch to Adobe RGB, you realize that Adobe RGB is a lot bigger. And if I manage to find, give me a second, Profoto RGB, you can see it's even bigger. So basically, let me just give you an idea. I'll just keep this for comparison and select sRGB, which is the, smaller, the smallest profile of the three. And you see how different they are. What does it actually mean? Because all oh, oh, this is fine, we have drawings, this is the theory, but in practice. In practice, it, it means like you are painting with a palette. And it's a very peculiar palette of colors, because the bigger it becomes, the more saturated and luminous the colors can be. So sRGB has a palette more or less like this size, then Adobe RGB is bigger, and Profoto RGB is like this. So one would say, oh, okay, I can always use Profoto RGB because I like to have many colors. Maybe I won't use all of them, but I want them to be available, which is a very good idea in theory. In practice, sometimes it makes things difficult. So you will decide which space to use depending on your uh, requirements, basically. Just remember one thing, which is very easy. sRGB, the smallest space of all three, is the official color space of the web. When you have to publish something on the web, don't think about it for even a second, convert everything to sRGB. You may lose some colors, but believe me, it's a lot less dangerous than putting out an image in another color space that some strange browser, some browser somewhere in the world will actually interpret as something different than you would expect, you know. So, if we turn for a second to CMYK, the, the numbers in CMYK describe the percentage of ink that hits the paper, and that's why they vary between zero and 100%. It's basically, if you're into printing, you really know that, it's about the dot size, that's it, in the screen. Uh, the components should be thought as inks, pigments, or colorants, whatever, and 0% means no ink, so what we see is the white of the paper. It's called paper white for a reason, in fact. And 100% is maximum ink. So if I say 100% cyan, it uh, just means that my substrate will be completely covered in cyan. There will be no holes in the screen. So zero in all components is white, and white is whatever the paper is. Whereas with black, uh, wrote your mileage, mileage may vary. And it is so because uh, the black formula depends on several factors, which are quite complex, but a lot of ink, of course. There is a neutrality condition, just to mention it. Not three identical components, but magenta and yellow basically identical, and cyan a bit higher. I can't tell you how much higher, because it depends on the formula, but generally higher. Again, CMYK is a color model, and then when we know how the inks behave when they hit the paper, the paper on a given machine and so on, we obtain a color space, like we did in RGB. There are several standard characterizations, so they are called, that are used. In Europe, it, we use Fogra. Not Fogra 39, which is just one of them, but we have Fogra 27, Fogra 51. They all correspond to different printing conditions, especially the paper is different. And all these have very or rather similar gamuts. And of course, when you turn to digital printing, you're still using CMYK inks plus additional inks, uh, and the gamut expands a lot because of this. It's a more expensive process. It's a relatively slower process in a way, but the conditions can become seriously different in some cases. Now, what I'm really interested in interested in speaking about today, um, LAB, or LAB, as we call it. Let's call it LAB, it's easier to say. Um, this is a very peculiar color space, and I need to show you how it works, because otherwise it will all be theory. 
So uh, the L channel, it's called lightness, uh, remind you, it describes how dark or light a color is. So if you're looking at the color and it's very, very light, brilliant, luminous, it's going to be high in the L, otherwise a dark, subdued color will be low in the L channel. The variation is between 0 and 100, but don't get confused, it's the opposite than CMYK. In CMYK, 0 means no ink, so what we see is actually the paper. In LAB, 0 means no lightness, so it's very dark, it's the opposite. And 100 is maximum light. The A and B channel, and this is the most difficult thing to grasp about LAB, uh, describe the color, and this color is completely unrelated to luminosity. A describes whether a color is based towards green or magenta. Uh, B describes whether a color goes towards blue or yellow. When we put all these together, and I show that in a minute, we can build any kind of tint and saturation. And then we control how light or dark the color is by the L parameter. Also, one thing that sometimes is confusing, the A and B channels can be negative. They can vary between 100 minus 128 and 127. Okay? If you wonder why it's asymmetrical, it has to do with mathematics, but it's not important. We have zero more or less in the middle, it's just moved one step actually, but that's neutrality for us. So, as I already told you, there is just one LAB inside Photoshop. You can find in theory several variants of LAB, but for what we are concerned with, the color model and the color space are the same thing in this case, because there is no possible variation. And the most important thing, LAB has an enormous gamut. It contains colors that we can't see, but incredibly also colors that we can't think about. And I may also explain why if you wish. But just to give an idea, let's go back to the color sync utility. Uh, let me, okay, let me guess. I could get, okay, Adobe RGB which is relatively big. It's in the middle, basically. I hold this for comparison, and Lab swallows it completely. Let's do the opposite. I will hold this for comparison, and this is Adobe RGB inside LAB. If you want to know, more or less, how big is a CMYK profile, this is it. We have a lot less colors available when we print offset onto the paper than we have in Adobe RGB, but L LAB is so huge, you know? Um, okay. Now, I would like to try to make a confrontation between these color spaces, because uh, in retouching, in post-productions, uh, you better know what you're doing and use the right color space for what you are trying to achieve. Uh, of course, like everything, all these color spaces have uh, pros and cons, of course. The choice of what we want to use depends on a lot of factors, including ability of the people who actually work in a certain color space. CMYK is getting difficult because it's been abandoned in, during the years and it's rather hard to find someone who is really, really knowledgeable about CMYK today. It's not even taught anymore in school, which is a pity. Um, and the kind of output, of course, that we'd like to obtain. So every space has a character. Let's see them quickly. RGB, the pros, it's a very intuitive color space. Everybody can handle RGB. Photographers are very familiar with them because their images actually start out in RGB. Digital photography, of course, revolves around this color space, but also inkjet printers expect an RGB file as input. There is a misconception about this. Sometimes you see this big Epson or Canon or whatever printer and they tell you, this is an RGB printer. Huh? 
So if you're not expert, you may think that there are red, green and blue inks inside, which is of course not true. RGB printers only means that the machine expects that you feed it with an RGB file. If you give it a CMYK file, it can be recognized, but what will happen? The machine will immediately reconvert the file to some kind of internal RGB and then do his things, you know. So um, it's useless to send a CMYK file to an RGB printer. You only lose color in the middle, so it's not a good idea. The serious cons about RGB is that some very specialized techniques which are incredibly useful cannot be applied in RGB and you need other color spaces. CMYK, if you are into CMYK pure printing, it gives you utmost complete control on what you print, basically. So it's better to tweak the images in CMYK if you know what you're doing. Also because, as I showed you, it has a very small gamut, and so you can do very, very fine changes to the color. Also, CMYK, thanks to the presence of the black ink, is the most powerful color space where you can handle the shadows. And I don't mean the shadows that we are projecting as uh, people and objects, but the dark areas of the images, hmm? so-called shadows in photography. The cons, well, the pro about having a small, a small gamut has a counterpart. The small gamut makes it impossible to obtain bright and brilliant colors in certain areas. Yellow is fantastic in CMYK. Magenta goes down quite well, but cyan is terrible. So we have terrible greens and terrible blues. You can't make an electric blue in CMYK or a very vivid bright green. There is simply no way to get it out of those inks because the cyan ink dulls it down, okay? It would be possible to produce a better cyan ink, but it would be also enormously costly. Somebody told me 20 times as much. So when you go out and buy, uh, the situation would be that when you go out and buy your beautiful table book with, you know, skies and palms from Florida in the States and would be full of blue, would be very vivid, but it would probably cost 300 euros. So it's not viable economically. We have to stick with what we have. The cons, uh, okay, are the small game. And as I told you, it, it is a very difficult to grasp it completely. And there are less experts now than in the past. LAB. LAB is the color space that you should use when you need to make big, and I do mean big, changes in color. There is nothing else like LAB. Also, the separation of luminosity and color opens the doors to completely new techniques. And LAB is extremely fast at times, which is very interesting when you're in production. Of course, the drawbacks, it has a huge gamut. gamut so. Uh, it's very easy to produce inadvertently colors that you can actually print. Not today, not in 20 years, probably. Also, it is not very easy to understand at first. Um, now, I would like to speak more about LAB because it, it is the less known color space. It is probably not very widespread yet among professionals. At least that's my feeling when I go around and do my courses. What I can tell you is that retouchers tend to use it a lot. Photographers a bit less. Graphic designers usually ignore it. They say, well, it's, it's not useful to me, but that's not really true. And I would like to show you how it works a bit more in depth. And uh, to do that, uh, I'll show you something. Just to give an idea that I was not lying when I told you that LAB can be extremely efficient and fast. Okay, so have a beautiful lady with a beautiful dress. The nightmare for every retoucher is the art director coming in, possibly at the end of the shift, saying, okay, I need a version of this one. The picture is perfect, but I want the color to be based on a certain Pantone sample. And they give you a number. I want to show you, let's go close you need to change only the dress. How on earth are you supposed to select this? 
You can. It takes five hours, hmm? more or less. Or two seconds, if you know how to do it. Let me show you. First, move the image into LAB. If you try to do anything like this outside LAB, you, you'll never be able to do it. Open up a layer called Solid Color. Go to the color library. Let me just get a Pantone. Do we like the 144? OK. What we have is, you see it here in the layers. The image is still there, but it's hidden by this solid color layer change the mode to color and in principle we succeeded because if you see the dress has the right color unfortunately all the rest has the wrong color so by not making a selection this is what happens but LAB is a lot smarter than you think like this for instance what do you think? I'm finished. This is before and this is after. Nothing else is affected, no selections. Only because I know how the channels work and where I should be. And if you want a green one, say this one, it can be done. It doesn't take that much. Okay. This is the power of LAB, but it's not limited to this, of course. Now that I've shown you how it works, I would like to show you why it works this way, which is the interesting part, in my opinion. Um, okay, I'll just use this. This is uh, simply a picture of uh, four different pieces of uh, cloth. And, uh, Please, have a look at the colors, because they are important. I haven't chosen the colors uh, randomly. We have blue, yellow. This is a strange kind of green. It's what, uh, in Italian, we call it verde. But the Anglo-Saxon word has another word, another word for this. It's called teal, not green. Another kind of green would be lime. We don't have enough words to, de to describe it. So this is teal green. This is a light magenta and this is red. Now, I will move uh, the image into LAB. But before I do that, I'll show you the RGB channels because we are in RGB. You're probably familiar with this. This is the red component. This is the green component. This is again the blue component. Nothing new. If I went CMYK, I would have the cyan, magenta, yellow, and black channel available. Now, let's go in LAB, and you see that something changes here. Well, let's start from lightness. Lightness is very easy to understand. I told you, the lighter the color, the lighter the channel. It's simply some kind of luminosity. You may say, okay, but I, I thought luminosity was a bit different in the color image. Um, I'll try to explain why. Just uh, for instance, uh, look at some of these colors, like the green, appear, it, it has a, a different feeling somehow, and the blue as well. This is because when color is present, our visual system reacts to luminosity in a different way. The more saturated the color is, the lighter it seems to us. It's called Helmholtz Kohlrausch effect. And that's one of the reasons why street signs and so on are so vivid, you know? Basically, it's economics. It takes less electric power to feed the lamp. Otherwise, if we had, uh, say, a red light with a very dim color, it would take a huge light to make it visible, you know? We use very saturated colors for these reasons, basically. Also now, let's see the A channel and the B channel, which are very, very strange. They are so dull, so squashed out, they have no contrast at all. Okay, this is the composite image. This is the lightness, and I don't think anyone has problems with the lightness. This is the luminosity of the image without the color. I'm now going to show you, because LAB does just this. 
the color of the image at constant luminosity. We take the luminosity variation away completely and rely on the color only. And what you get is this. It's not without luminosity. We can't see anything without luminosity. But do you remember I told you that L goes from 0 to 100? When I select these two channels, it's 50 throughout. And you don't see any lightness variation. This is a bit difficult to grasp, so I have another example. And that's a funny story. Well, not a funny story. I made up the story. It's an image you all know, I think. But believe it or not, the reason why poor John Lennon died in 1980 shot in New York and not on Abbey Road on that day in, 97, in 1969, the reason why this happened is connected to LAB. I'm not joking, let me explain. You know that there are some visual problems in the people, like uh, Daltonism. Some people are unable to uh, tell a color from another. There is one extreme form of Daltonism called achromatopsy, which means that basically you see black and white. Okay, so more or less because there will be other problems connected, but some, somebody having achromatopsy would see this, okay? This is an illness indeed. But in humans, no one ever found the opposite illness, that we see color and don't perceive luminosity. The reason why this illness doesn't exist is also why nobody was killed on that day. Let me show you why. Before I show you this, have a look. John Lennon is white, Ringo Starr is black, Paul McCartney is uh, gray. The zebra crossing is black and grayish. The asphalt is more or less gray. So except for the faces, a bit of the hair, the leaves, the sky and George Harrison's dress. All we have here is neutral colors. If what I told you is right, this must go into luminosity but be identical in LAB. Because any gray, any white, any black, if we only look at the color, is neutral. Let's see if it's true. Luminosity is lightness, what we expect. Now, the A and the B. Everything neutral disappears completely. It's not anymore black or white or gray. It's uniformly neutral. What you see here, this is George. These are the faces. This is the sky, greenish leaves, but all the rest. Can you imagine a driver having this kind of illness trying to, <laughs> to go through there? He wouldn't see the people crossing, you see. So it's very important for us to see color, but it's a lot more important to see luminosity. We couldn't survive like this. We would be blind, basically, okay? So this is the nature of lab. Black, white, gray are only defined in the L channel. A and B are neutral. This is how it works. And this is how we can separate things, basically. Let's see why. This is a scheme trying to explain how it goes. If you remember, I told you that the A channel is related to green and magenta, which are called opponent colors. This is the A channel. The higher the number you see here, the lighter it becomes, because this is the, the luminosity. But you have green on one side, then it becomes neither green nor magenta, so neutral in that channel, and then it goes up to magenta. The B channel is exactly the same, only it deals with blue and yellow. It goes from blue to neither blue nor yellow to yellow. And you can't separate these colors. Combinations of these make every other color. And the rule seems complex, but it's quite simple. 
When you're dealing with a negative A, do you remember I told you it can be negative? You are looking at a green color, or, to better say it, a color that has a tendency to be green. Or if you want to go completely over the top, but scientifically this is what we should say, a color that is more green than it is magenta. Okay? Because you can separate them. Now, on the other side, when we have positive A, you are looking at the color that goes towards magenta. Or if you want, that it is more magenta than it is green. Negative B means towards blue. Positive B means towards yellow. Easy so far, but where's the red? We can build a red. It lies in the middle of yellow and magenta, so it will have both positive components. If we go down by 90 degrees, we find a different kind of green. This is teal, this is lime, this is uh, the green of vegetables, greenery, basically. The grass is like this, not like this. This is too blue for the grass, okay? And the rule is negative A, positive B. 90 more degrees and you get cyan, which is the opposite, the opponent of red, and therefore is reversed. A and B are negative. And finally you have violet, quite rare, towards magenta, but also towards blue, which means positive A, negative B. So, let's see if this is true. Let me open... Um, let me open another picture. I will use this one. How would you call this color? I'm not sure I'm many things, about many things in life, but here's one of my certainties. That is magenta. <laughs> Believe me. It, it, uh, I took this picture. I was doing the video, actually. It was taken with a camera. And these three girls were impossible to reproduce on video because it was so intense, the magenta, that it would completely blow out the sensor. On the video, you have a red blob going around, so it was a very intense color. If this is true, we expect to have a very high value in the A channel, which is green magenta, and that value should be positive. Let's see if it's true. We can see it with uh, a very important tool of Photoshop called the Info Panel, or Palette, if you want. I will put my eyedropper here. Look at the numbers. The first one is luminosity, 42, more or less in the middle, I believe that. 61 points in the B, remember the maximum is 127, and about, uh, sorry, in the A, and about six points in the B. Slight tendency to yellow, but nothing too important indeed in the B. Now look at the grass, that's green. If what I told you is true, you should have in the grass negative A and positive B because it's a famous lime axis. Let's see if it's true. Okay. Lightness 37, which means this area is a bit less luminous than this one, I believe it. Minus 13 in the A, which means tendency to green. 37, it's correct, believe me, in the B, strong um, intensity of yellow. We say the grass is green, tending with a tendency to go towards yellow, but technically the grass is yellow and going towards green, because yellow is a lot stronger, always. I don't know exactly what the shirts of these ladies will be, but I expect them to be almost white. And in fact, 95 almost at the top, so very, very light, and 1-1, one, one. what did I tell you? 0-0 zero, zero would be perfect neutrality. Here, you could say it's one point towards magenta, one point towards yellow, but that's neutral to me. 
And let's just see, see the skin tone, for instance, here on the arm, so that we are sure we are not uh, finding any makeup that gives a strange color or whatever. 68, rather light area. 14 points towards magenta, 25 points towards yellow. That's correct. We say the skin is pink, but it's not pink. If you look at our skin, it is orange, more or less. It goes towards yellow and usually not very saturated. Then you have maybe the Nordic character that is a bit more pink, but this is a general formula. It always works. So what I'm showing you is that you can use the numbers in LAB to quickly evaluate color. And this is very important because remember that when you're looking at the monitor, your visual system will adapt to what you actually uh, see. So it will sort of correct a cast automatically, which is not what we want, because maybe we are looking at something which is a bit bluish, and it should be neutral, and after a while we will see neutral, simply. But when it goes out to print, you have that beautiful white margin around, and it will look blue by comparison. So it's very important to measure the numbers, okay? So, uh, some of the characters of lab. Okay, you understood we have a huge gamut which some of the colors of LAB are impossible for us to see. Why? Because they are too bright, they are too saturated. We have limits in our visual system, of course. And if you take LAB literally, there are some very, very weird colors. Do you want an example? Okay. If I say I have, uh, okay, 50, zero, zero. Look at this. 50, zero, zero means just halfway the luminosity, so it's a gray, basically. And zero, zero means absolutely neutral. So we are looking at an achromatic color. We call it gray, okay? Now, if I change 50 to zero, it means light is off and it is neutral, so this is black. But in principle, no one could ever keep me from building a color like this. Read it on the basis of what I told you. Remember, positive A and positive B means red. There is absolutely no light in this color, so it's as dark as the night. But it is, at the same time, the most vivid red that you can imagine, like a laser. <laughs> the brain stops. You can't imagine a color that is absolutely dark and absolutely brilliant at the same time. It's what we call an oxymoron. Hmm? That is a contradiction in terms. Hmm? Like the rich photographer, the honest Italian politician, things that can ever exist in the world, you know? So, what does Photoshop do in these cases? Why is it representing a color? You're asking Photoshop to produce something impossible, so he will say, okay, I stop here and split the difference. Try to make color that is visible and red. There are rules written inside, but you're actually looking at an impossible color, okay? This is no this is nothing like it should be. You simply get out of whatever is logical, but it is a color that is defined somehow. And believe it or not, this can have a lot of interesting applications in practice. I may show you one later. Um, yes, okay. Then, there is a, an absolute meaning of LAB. Give me the numbers and I'll know exactly which colors you are referring at. All the Pantone libraries are somewhere have the numbers in LAB written. Hmm? So it is an absolute reference for color in general. It is a very good 
connection space for conversion between color spaces. We're talking about RGB and CMYK. When you convert or your machine automatically converts to CMYK, there is LAB working behind. RGB goes to LAB, LAB goes to CMYK. Usually it's this. Otherwise, you may use another color space called XYZ instead of LAB, but most of the times it's this one that does the job. Also, it is, as we say, perceptually uniform. RGB is not perceptually uniform. Like, you look at luminosity in RGB, if you move 10 steps towards a lighter color and then another 10 steps, you would expect to see lightness being proportional in its growth at every step. But it's not like that. In LAB, it is a lot more accurate. Not perfect, but accurate, yes. It can isolate colors, I show you, that's true, as no other space can, really. And also, this is very important, it is able to enhance color micro variation, which is something we absolutely need if we want, of course, that could not be the scope, but if we want that, if we want a photograph to look more like reality, we need variation to make it more real. And LAB is the space of choice for this. Also, if you're not very careful, LAB is so huge and so delicate to handle that it can ruin your image in seconds, really. So you really have to know what you have to do. LAB can be frustrating because people are very excited by what it can do. They try to use it. They, maybe no one told them that moving a curve by this step could completely throw off the color balance in your image and they are dissatisfied with the result. But it's just a matter of learning it. Let me show you just an example of what LAB can do and how quick it is as well. And for this I need to recover one of the pictures that I used in this morning session. Okay. So, this is, a, this is a very fresh picture because I took that yesterday afternoon. So you see, it's uh, the Köln skyline. It doesn't have enormously vivid colors. All the colors are more or less correct. It's one of the possible versions that we could make of these pictures. But, ask yourself the question, if you had been there on the bridge, would you have seen this or something else? Because it's such a striking skyline, your senses are very much attracted by what you see. And I know what I'm saying, it's not a theory, it's in practice. We really bring forward with our visual system what we are interested in. And what I remember about yesterday was the color of the water, the green of the plants, and variations everywhere. I don't see that much in the picture. Let's see if LAB could help. What I'm going to do is using a, a script that has absolutely nothing to do with external plugins. What you're going to see now and I'll just hit this button here. Everything is done in Photoshop. Uh, I must tell you, you will see something enormously saturated now, far too much, but I did so because I would like to cut it back a bit, maybe. I could as well keep it. No, to green. Okay bit less saturation. Let me zoom in. I want to show you the before and after. Do you see what I mean by micro variation of color? It's not something huge, but it will make a lot of detail stand out, you know. So it's very important because you know far too well if you're into printing that every step you take, you sort of lose some detail and some color. When you have this incredibly vivid and uh, sharp image on the screen, 
and you print it. Sometimes you say, oh, yeah, nice, but it's a bit dull. It depends also on which technology you use and so on. But it mostly depends on the nature of the photograph. So believe me, it's a typical thing when you have to give 110 to obtain 100. There is always a diminishing return in this process. So all the techniques that you can use to make uh, better images for your client, because this is a better image than the other, in my opinion, it is more representative. Unless, of course, we want to go completely abstract and say, OK, I want to turn this uh, afternoon scenery into something like I would have seen it at night. OK, give me a couple of hours, I can do it in Photoshop, but that's changing reality completely, you know. But it can be done, and it can be done in LAB better than any other color space. Hmm? And it's not very difficult. So, it depends on what you're doing. If you're into design, into preparation of images, LAB is a really important weapon. Hmm? Just to give you an idea, I told you that I studied with Dan Margulis. Exactly 10 years ago, these days more or less, a book was released. It was the only book on the LAB subject entirely devoted to that. And it was uh, released on Pitch Pit Press, which is a big uh, American publisher. And the publisher basically said, OK, let's do it. It won't sell very much. And it was the best seller in its category for six months. So when people discovered LAB, they were extremely excited because they discovered that they could do things that couldn't be done otherwise before. And there is still a margin of uh, improvement. It's still going strong today. And if you're into color management and so on, it helps a lot to understand that there is a connection space behind everything, you know, and uh, that you can use absolute values, at least inside Photoshop, to define colors. So getting completely out of the device-dependent uh, slavery, I would say. It, yeah? uh, this is used also to connect different profiles, uh, device links, several things. Okay, so I think that's all for me. If you want to know more about these subjects in general, I have a blog called, uh, I have two actually, one in Italian if you're from Italy, that's MarcoOlivotto.com, and uh, the English version, uh, the twin version, it's a thin twin, basically, there are less articles here. It's called MO on Photoshop, so moonphotoshop.com. And no, there is no next session. This is my last one uh, for this year. So thanks to you and uh, to all the other people who came to the other five sessions I did in the previous days. Uh, thank you, Köln. Danke schön, Köln. And uh, I hope to see you again in Amsterdam, I think, next year. Hope to be there. I will still be doing things about color management and color correction, trying to bring in something new. And since we have five minutes before the next session, if there is any question that you have, I will be very glad to reply. Otherwise, we can just stop by after if you wish. And thank you very much.